Madness and hate erupt anew in Dallas as President Kennedy's accused assassin is shot down himself during a jail transfer. There's an ominous symbol in Lee Harvey Oswald's murder weapon as he is taken to the city jail basement where an armored car is to move him to a maximum security cell. Oswald walks his last mile. His assailant moves in from the right. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. Now, from another camera, the motion is slowed. The murderer moves in, and here is the shame of all America as Jack Rubenstein takes the law unto himself. The dying Oswald is rushed to the same hospital where President Kennedy died. Doctors work to save his life. But 48 hours and 7 minutes after the president's death, his accused slayer is dead. November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy is gunned down in Dallas. Officially, Lee Harvey Oswald fired the fatal shots from the Texas Book Depository. But now, a local man's got history in the crosshairs. Did Lee Harvey Oswald kill President John F. Kennedy? No. Had nothing to do with it. Former FBI agent Don Adams from Summit County says thousands of National Archives prove... The Warren Commission was was nothing but a bunch of liars. The Korean War veteran entered the FBI September 1962. He was assigned to Thomasville, Georgia, where he began investigating a man named Joseph Adams Miltier. He was reported to be one of the most violent men in the country. A friend of Miltier's, William Somerset, who was also an FBI informant, said Miltier was threatening JFK. And Somerset was telling them that he was really radical and he was saying bad things about what they wanted to do to Kennedy. Agent Adams completed the Miltier investigation, and a week later, shots rang out in Dallas. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. It, it devastated me, and I thought to myself, what did I do wrong? His boss said, find Miltier. I said goodbye to my partner. He never said a word to me about anything about Miltier that he knew him or anything. Many years later, Don learned that agents contacted his partner, who told them Miltier was in Georgia, essentially eliminating him as a suspect. And that shocked me when I saw that document because I knew it was an outright lie. Then, when Adams finally captured Miltier days later, he says his supervisor prohibited him from conducting a proper interrogation. Miltier was released and Agent Adams transferred. And where did I go but to Dallas, Texas? He remembers seeing the Zapruder film for the very first time. And all of a sudden I saw the president go like this with his hands. And I said, Hal, I said, he was, shot in the, he was shot in the throat. The minute that you have a frontal shot, Oswald can't be the shooter. Because this came from a grassy knoll. And Oswald was in Texas School Book Depository. The Warren Commission said three shots were fired, but Don counted 11. Uh, the agent said to me, Don, uh, be careful what you say and how you say it because the Warren Commission is here and they've already ruled that Oswald is the shooter and there were no shots from the front. The Army veteran wondered how Oswald fired three shots in seven and a half seconds from a bolt action rifle. I'm going to tell you something right now, guys. There's no way in the world Oswald shot that weapon and boy, I mean, I was really cautioned then. Don eventually retired from the FBI, never thinking twice about Miltier, until 1992, when he saw a picture in this book, which he says positively places Miltier in Dallas the day of the shooting. Joseph Adams Miltier, looking at the presidential car moments before the president was killed. At the National Archives and Records Administration, Don found many reports missing or manipulated, including his file on Miltier from 63. Everything that I had done was gone. Everything was gone. But the most startling discovery was a tape recording captured by Miami intelligence officers November 9th, 1963, just weeks before Dallas. Miltier is talking to the informant, William Somerset. The FBI headquarters and Secret Service both had that tape within days. I should have stopped the president from traveling instantly. But they didn't. And he says he was jubilant. Bragging to Somerset, you thought I was kidding when I said he would be killed from a window with a high-powered rifle. 
Despite all of that, Miltier was never even mentioned in the Warren Commission report. When Hoover set up the propaganda in the FBI, don't embarrass the FBI. That was his rules. And you didn't. So they ordered everything put into the archives and to be forgotten about it. But Don can't forget and hopes something is done before the truth is buried forever. I mean, when we die off, when we're gone, there's not going to be anybody who's going to sit here and tell you these things. I hope the truth gets told, whatever it is. In Summit County, Suzanne Stratford, Fox 8 News. The dark side is that I'm extremely moody and very introverted. And that's where I've always been told I'm like my father. She was born 28 years ago in a suburb of Dallas, Texas. She grew up as Rachel Porter. Porter was the name of her stepfather, a man who raised her with love as if she were his own. But for years now, Rachel Porter has been forced to live with the legacy of her true heritage, a heritage she discovered one afternoon while sifting through mementos in the family attic. All I remember is playing up in the attic and going through this box of letters and seeing Oswald and Oswald and this man Oswald, but yet I had no idea who this man Oswald was. Rachel was only a month old when her real father died. She wasn't old enough to watch TV that week in November 1963, the week President Kennedy was shot dead in Dallas. She couldn't recognize her daddy on the screen when Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested for the crime, the weekend he was shot dead on national television. I don't want to know Lee Harvey Oswald, the, the accused assassin. I want to know Lee Harvey Oswald, the father, my father. But Rachel did attend her father's funeral. That's her in her grandmother's arms when America buried Lee Harvey Oswald without a single tear. For 28 years, she has remained silent until now. Speaking with Kennedy historian David Lipton, author of a forthcoming book about her father, Rachel tells how her mother and stepfather sheltered her from the legacy of Lee Harvey Oswald. Growing up out in the country, we were away from everything. We were away from the city, we were away from the public eye. She just did not want us to come in contact with anything that would maybe remind us or be a part of this kind of thing that they were trying to keep us away from. We'd heard the Oswald name in the house, but he was like a mystery man. We knew that this name would always uh, instill pain or grief or, up, or would make my mother upset or upset the house with this name, this name. Her mother and stepdad did what they could to give Rachel as normal a life as possible, but they couldn't hide. We would have the, the local eyewitness news teams follow us to school. And when Rachel arrived at school, she was the only girl in class whose daddy's name appeared in the history book. Everything written then, or at least everything I was exposed to or heard about, never talked about innocence, so I always thought that, that he did it. As she grew into womanhood, Rachel left her small town and ventured into the big city to go to college. But wherever she went, she felt like a marked woman, reluctant to reveal her true name. Audrey Marina Rachel Oswald Porter. However, I only go by Porter as a safety measure. And she soon found the consequences of letting people know that her father was one of the most infamous men of our time. I've had attention from men when I did not have attention from them until they knew who I was. And suddenly I have a lot of attention from men. I, I, I can think of one man in particular, or two men in particular, who think that I'm just terrific only because I'm Lee Harvey Oswald's daughter. They think that I have a connection with a famous person. Oh. And it's like, they have, it's like their brush with fame, I think. Oh, I see. Which, is, which is a complete turn off to me. But it was only recently that Rachel was faced with the most ironic twist of all. It took a lifetime for Rachel to come to grips with the belief that her father, Lee Harvey Oswald, was the man who killed President Kennedy. But then, after years of reading and hearing all the theories, she came to the belief that her father was not an assassin, but a victim framed for the crime of the century. My whole outlook on life has changed just by hearing that, that there's evidence that completely exonerates this man of the crime of killing the president. Um, now, I'm not saying that he is not uh, involved. I believe he's involved, or else why would he be there? But I don't know. I really believe, though, that he didn't kill the president. And my whole life has been plagued by this idea that my father is, a, is the murderer of one of the most loved persons in the world. And, and if, I, if, that, if he's not responsible for that, then that means that a great part of the burden that I have to carry is gone. And interestingly, she feels a kinship to the Kennedy family. Well, I wonder 
come November, I, I wonder how painful it is for them. I wonder how painful it is for them to see their father gunned down. And I wonder if they wonder how painful it is for me to see my father gunned down. Rachel still lives in Texas. She's studying to be a nurse. She's still single and looks forward to getting married and leading a normal life. If you could tell your father one thing, what would it be? <sighs> I would say, how could you leave your wife and your two kids to carry this burden? Do you remember where it is exactly? 